God. Praise God. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. If you have your Bible, can you just kind of wave it at me if you have one? If you have a Bible, iPad, that's right, iPad, phone, that's right. I mean, I see a lot of lit up phones, lit up Bibles everywhere. That's right. Amen. Praise God. How many of you that the Word of God is transforming? The Bible says active. It's a two-edged sword that changes our lives. So we turn to John chapter 12, verse 1 through 7. Praise God. If you're there, say amen. 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 And the Word of God says this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Everybody say raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to, keep him, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Praise God. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the anointing, Lord God, upon the word right now. We pray, oh God, that you would just make us receptive, that we open our hearts and our minds, Lord God, and meet us right where we are. We're all in different places on on this journey, Lord God. So, Father, meet us and speak to us clearly today, Lord God. And we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This morning I've titled my message, Give God what he wants. Give God what he wants. Have you ever received a gift that though it was thoughtful, it really wasn't what you wanted? I remember as a kid wanting a pair of Converse All-Stars. Come on, somebody. See, if you're from from New York, everybody in New York wanted the Keds. Come on, the Pro Keds, right? There you go. I see some New Yorkers going, yeah, that's what we wore. But see, in Chicago, where I grew up, man, it was Converse All-Stars, man, Chuck Taylors. And, you know, I wanted them so bad, and I put it on my list for Christmas, and uh, I guess I must have been naughty because I never received a pair my whole life. I kept putting it on there and just never got it because they looked good, and all the other boys wore them, and I wanted to wear them and be cool like everybody else, but I never bought, got a pair for Christmas. That's why today I own three pairs. Come on, somebody. You know why? Because I can. We were too poor back then. Back then, the Converse All-Stars cost like, I don't know, $14, $15. I'm dating myself, right? Man, you could buy like five pairs of slip and slides for that right there. Come on. She said, I could get the whole family them slip and slide cheap gym shoes for the same price of those one pair. So she never got me a pair, but that's okay. I received a lot of other nice things as well, but not always the things that I wanted. Have you ever been there? Ladies, you know the deal. He took you out to dinner, a nice location, said it was going to be a special night. And of course, you've been dating for a little while, and in the back of your mind, you're wondering, what's going to be special tonight? So you get to the restaurant, the atmosphere is beautiful, there's music in the background, it's candle lit. So you're thinking, oh man, this might be the night. Come on, somebody. He he might want to put a down payment on our relationship. Come on now. You know what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, you know, you get there, you're eating, you're happy, and then he says, honey, I have a big surprise. He reaches in his pocket and he pulls out two front row tickets. Come on, somebody to his favorite wrestling match. (laughs) And you're like, oh, that's really nice. Guys, you know you've been hitting around for a while. You want to get that that, that beautiful fishing rod. You've been checking it out. You've been going, man, I want to go fishing. Maybe there's something else. You've been throwing hints 
Like, hey, you know, go by Pro Bass Shop, check out the fishing stuff, whatever. You, you actually showed it to her. You thought, man, she says, you know, honey, I'm making a special dinner for us tonight. And I got something special I want to share. And you think, man, that's it. I get my fishing rod. So she comes in and she feeds you a nice dinner, has a little smooth jazz playing in the background. Come on, some of y'all might know what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden you eat that nice, wonderful meal and you're like, man, this is so good. And you're just waiting for her to pull out a box. And then she reaches down and out of her purse and she pulls out reservations for his and her pedicures. (laughs) By the way, it's not that bad, fellas, okay? I want to let let you know. I've been there, okay? Pedicures and his and her massages. Come on, somebody. But anyway, so so we've all been there. I mean, we've all been somewhere where we thought we were going to get something, and then something else kind of transpires. And, you know, a couple of weekends ago, many people celebrated Valentine's Day. Did anybody here celebrate Valentine's Day? Anybody? Okay, no. Wow. You guys are dead. Come on, somebody. Oh, somebody waved, at least one person. Okay, the rest of y'all, what happened? No, anyway, I won't go there. Just to see, if, if you were on social media, you would see all kinds of pictures and all kinds of posts and captions and all these things. People were taking pictures of the restaurants they went to and all the nice gifts they received. You know, expressing their love and appreciation for that special someone in their lives. And I think that that's important and that's vital because how many know God is a God of love? And at times, he allows us to experience his love through other people. See, however, being a realist, I do have to give you the flip side of the coin. See, we must be reminded that everything that glitters isn't always gold. While some folks had a great time, others did not have such a victorious Valentine's Day. See, somebody wanted to go out, but they ended up staying home. Somebody wanted a quiet evening with their loved one, with their sweetheart, but ended up in a crowd of people that they didn't know and they didn't like. Somebody wanted a necklace and received a bracelet. Somebody wanted a bracelet, but they wanted a ring. Come on, put a ring on this thing. Come on, somebody. I mean, isn't that the best time to do it, right, during Valentine's Day? See, not everyone's Valentine's experience was a a good one. See, there are times when we are deeply disappointed, and some disappointments doesn't mean that people are ungrateful. It just may mean that they are in relationship with someone that's unaware of what their love language really is. Oh, come on. So that person may have the right objective, but you may have the wrong approach. See, that person may have the right intention, but the wrong method. That person may have the right purpose, but the wrong plan. See, they're giving that person what they want to give, want them to have, but they're not giving them what they want. And if any relationship is gonna be healthy and, and sustainable, the people involved must learn how to speak each other's love language. Now, what is a love language, Pastor Carlos? I'm so glad you asked. A love language is a way to express and experience love. And many people can be in a relationship and be frustrated because somebody is speaking a language that does not make them feel loved. They are giving you what they like, but not what you want. So that means that folks are in relations with each other. They must be willing to pause for the the cause. Everybody hit the pause button. You got to pause for the cause and teach them how to love you. Come on, somebody. how, How do you do that, Pastor Carlos? It's very simple. Just say things like, you know, I really love it when you blank. Come on, somebody. That's how you slowly begin to share your love language with others so they will know what it is. And maybe you can even say, you know, I really don't care very much when this happens. And little by little, you communicate your love language, and then you can also walk in unity when it comes to that. Very, very, very important. And you see, just as relations with people, okay, also our relationship with God 
is important because how many know God has a love language? Oh, come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got to find out what that is. See, today we're going to discuss one of his love languages. It's his primary love language. It's a love language that he loves over every other thing that we can do. This love language I'm referring to is what the Bible calls worship. Everybody say worship. worship. See, worship is God's love language. If you want God to know how you feel, if you want him to feel loved uh, by you, because how many know he's, he loves us? The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave. But you see, in order for God to also know that we love him, we, we express ourselves through worship. See, what is worship? It simply means this, to express worth, to express what It doesn't mean to feel gratitude. It means to express worth. See, people don't benefit from the love you feel. They benefit from the love you show. Oh, man. See, how many of you can't just say you love them and not display it? Come on, somebody. Because what you say is one thing, but what you do is totally something else. And why does God want us to worship him? Why is that so important? Does God have an insecurity problem where he needs my frequent reminder of how good he is? Does God have amnesia and forgotten, he has forgotten who he is and, and, and needs me to continue to tell him, God, you are so-and-so? Not at all. You see, all God's instructions, all that God tells us is for my benefit. Everything God instructs us to do is for your benefit. Turn to the person next to you and say, hey, you, it's, he's talking to you right now. The Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name and forget not his benefits. You see, everything God instructs us to do also benefits us. See, whenever God asks me to do something, it's not because he needs me to do it. It's because I need to do it. So when he tells me to forgive my enemies, he doesn't tell me that because he needs to tell me. He tells me that because I need to do it. Because I heard it said one time that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. How many of that, that unforgiveness does not hurt the other person? It hurts you. And it's a load that we don't need to carry as well. Now, because this area of worship is so vital and so important. If it's his love language, then we can't afford to be elementary in our understanding of it. See, this is an area you want to do well because when it comes to worship, God is not desperate. God is not desperate for your worship because just because it's offered doesn't mean it's always accepted. Mm, come on, somebody. Just because you bring the offering. Listen, Cain and Abel bro both brought their offerings of worship before the Lord, and one of them was unacceptable. Come on. Now, our text today gives us an example of how God wants to be praised. In other words, example of how to give God not what you want to give him, but what he wants. How many know that if somebody loves something, they will tell you what it is, hopefully? So a lot of folks say, well, pastor, I'm not the kind of person that does this, and I'm not the kind of person that does that. See, worship is not about you. Come on, somebody. It's not about who you are or what you feel comfortable with. My question is this. Do you want God to know that you love him? Come on, somebody. See, because worship is never about us. It's all about pleasing him. So if we know exactly what God wants, it's in the word of God how to worship and how to love him. If we do that, then we're being obedient to God's word. And guess what? We're speaking his love language. Amen? So we see this in the word, and there's three things I want to pull out of the text that we just covered. And the first one is this. It's found in John 12, the first two verses. Her worship fill in the blank, was grateful. Her worship was grateful. John 12, 1 and 2 says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. 
Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. See, gratitude requires intentionality because our human nature tends to lean towards entitlement. You see, entitlement is the enemy of gratitude. See, you can't forget where you've been. You can't forget where you've been so you can remember, come on, where you are right now. To know you can't forget that God, listen, we may all have still have a long way to go. We are all a work in progress, amen? But at the same time, when you look back and say, man, I, I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be yet. Come on, somebody. But thank God I'm not where I used to be. Come on. Can you give the Lord a praise if you believe that? If you're grateful that God has moving you forward, you may still have a place to go or far to go, but man, you're moving in the right direction. See, many of us are living in answered prayer. Oh, listen to this. Many of us are, where you're living now is a place that you prayed for many years ago. Come on, somebody. So you're living in answered prayer, but now we're complaining because our answered prayer has become the norm. Oh, come on, somebody. And all, all of a sudden, we, we feel like, well, I've already got this, and, and, and now I'm praying for something else. Now, I, I feel like I should be entitled to more because we forget where we were. Come on, somebody. When God answered your prayer and you got that new house that you're living in right now, say, God, I needed more space. And now maybe you think you need more space. Well, God, now I'm unhappy. What you gave me, I got to go find something else. Nothing wrong with moving forward. But how many know contentment and godliness together is what keeps us, hallelujah, moving forward in Christ. And you see, we, contentment is not just standing still where you are. Contentment is being happy where you are as God is moving you to where he wants you to go. Come on, somebody. See, we're always on the move. Come on, give the Lord a praise if you believe that. You see, Mary's in the house, and she's ready to celebrate and honor Jesus. And sitting at the table is Lazarus, her brother. In chapter 11, the chapter before this, Lazarus was in a tomb, wrapped in grave clothes, dead and gone. Now she sees her brother sitting, laughing with Jesus, and she's overcome with gratefulness. She realizes that Jesus specializes in bringing dead things to life. See, the Bible says we were dead in our sin, but now we're alive in Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. See, Jesus gives life to a dead heart. Jesus gives life to dead religion. Jesus gives life to dead marriages. Come on. Jesus gives life to dead passions. Jesus gives life to dead hopes. Jesus gives life to dead dreams. Come on, somebody. See, I don't know about you, but when I came to Jesus, there were some dreams inside of me that I thought were gone. I thought that I was going to miss out on life. I, mean, I was depressed and I was broken and I didn't know where to go. I had no direction. But praise God. God, Jesus showed up. And when Jesus shows up, something begins to happen. Things that are dead, come on, somebody. They start coming to life. Come on, somebody. You'll start walking out of your tomb. Come on. Still dressed in your grave clothes. Come on, somebody. Still looking like, like you're dead, but God said, that's okay. Come out, of the, come out of where you are. I'm going to take those grave clothes off slowly but surely, and you're going to start walking in what I have for you. If you believe that, put your hands together one more time. God. Come on, hallelujah. hallelujah. Woo! See, some folks are dead, they don't even know it. Come on, somebody. That, that's why zombies, you ever see those zombie movies? Who's watching zombie movies in here? All right, yeah, we'll pray for your deliverance. The, the reason people, they, that, why they relate to zombies so much, because zombies are the walking dead. Come on, somebody. See, there's a lot of walking dead walking around this planet. At the end of the day, most of us were zombies. We were walking dead until Jesus, come on somebody, until the resurrection power of Jesus Christ touched our hearts, come on, and brought us to life. And now we have a purpose, amen? And God did something amazing. Jesus said this, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. See, it's not blessed people that are grateful. It's grateful people that are blessed. See, the gratefulness has to come first, and then God's blessing will follow. The second thing is this. Her worship was genuine. Her worship was genuine. 
In John 12, 4, it says this. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Now, if you recall in Luke chapter 10, Martha was distracted serving Jesus while Mary decided to sit at his feet and spend time with him. See, Martha sternly objected because she thought that working was more important than worship. Oh, let me come on this side and say it because I didn't get no love on this side when I said it. People think that working is more important than worship. Oh, come on. I'm not talking about just work. Working in the church. Come on, somebody. Working in the church, working for Christ will never replace worshiping Christ. Come on, somebody. At the end of the day, just because you're doing a lot of activity for Jesus doesn't mean that he actually knows who you are. At the end of the day, in Matthew, I love this scripture. Every time I read it, it kind of shakes me up a little bit, but it's, it's a scripture where Jesus is telling a parable of people saying, well, Jesus, did I not prophesy in your name? I mean, was I not on the worship team? Come on, somebody. Where's my worship team? Was I not, I mean, I wasn't a, a musician, like, wasn't I an a, a usher? Wasn't I, well, I, wasn't, wasn't I doing all this stuff, and, and I was praying for people, and the sick were being healed, and he said, absolutely. He goes, wow, that was amazing you did that. Who are you? Because I don't know you. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but that sense, it's all of us should just shake on the inside when Jesus said that. He said, that's great. You did all that, but who are you? He said, I don't know you. And he just rejected them. Because it's not enough to do the work without the worship. It's not enough, hallelujah, to go and think that you're going to walk in the door because you're going to be name dropping on the way in. You have to have a relationship with the person. Come on, somebody. You need to have a, a viable, intimate, passionate, close relationship with Jesus. And that's what he's looking for as well. You see, when you read this story, you see also that Judas also protested that she was wasting her resources on the Lord when she could give it to the poor. Now, in both of these cases, she ignored the opposition and focused on her devotion. See, genuine worship pleases God more than it pleases man. Come on, somebody. See, when I first came to Christ, I remember uh, um, some of the, a few of the church uh, men were, we went to a victory celebration up at the ranch. And we used to have this, it was such a wonderful time of celebration. Uh, it, was, it was around Labor Day every year. And man, it was great. I mean, all the families and all the men would come and bring their families and their wives and their children. We would just be celebrating uh, what God had done there at the ranch at Victory Celebration. And I remember coming out of my car and man, listen, I was one of those dudes that when I first got saved, and maybe still a little bit now, actually, if I'm honest, probably just a lot of bit still. I was just ignorance on fire. Come on, somebody. I knew nothing about God. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything. But man, how many know when you encounter the living God? When you've been in a tomb and a stone rolls away. Come on, somebody. When you've been dead and you've come back to life. Listen, I can't tell you where I was and how it happened. I just know one thing. I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, and now I'm alive. I was broken, and now I'm being healed on the inside. Don't tell me. I didn't, know, I didn't even know John 3.16. Come on, somebody. But let me tell you what I didn't know. I didn't know the word of God, but I knew the God of the word. Amen. And how many know that the God of the word, hallelujah, is, is just as important as just knowing God's word? I know people who know God's word, but don't know the God who wrote it. Come on, somebody. You can tell by the fruit, the Bible says. So you see, I remember, and I remember I always had a bounce in my step, man. When I got saved, I mean, how many know the pearl of great price? When you come to Jesus and you realize my goodness, I try to find this in the bars. I try to find it drinking. I try to find it smoking pot. I try to find it doing all these things, accomplishments and jobs. And when you come to that place, when you come to Jesus, you find out that Jesus was all you ever needed. Come on, somebody. That everything else was a counterfeit that the devil had 
So I, when I so man, so listen, I had a reason, come on, to have a bounce in my step and a smile on my face. And I remember going to that victory celebration, and they were, they were standing there talking. And as I walked to them, they kind of looked at me and chuckled. And this was their words. Oh, Carlos, we know you're all on fire for God. But one of these days, you'll kind of cool down like the rest of us. And then you'll be just kind of like the rest of us. And I said, what if I don't want to be like the rest of y'all? What if God's got something more? See, because what you don't understand, you have no idea what God has brought me out of. Come on, somebody. So you might be comfortable in your Christianity. But man, I know the hell I came out of. Come on, somebody. I knew the stuff I came out of. So I had a reason to jump up and down. And I didn't care what they said or what they thought. And I just kept doing my thing. Come on, somebody. I kept serving my God with all the passion I could muster up. Eventually, I did learn the Bible. Come on, somebody. It took me a little while, but I ended up learning what God had and, and went to Bible college, and it was just an amazing experience. But you see, I, 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 sometimes people will oppose you. Sometimes people will oppose you because you remind them of who they wish they were. Come on, somebody. They look at you, and you're a reflection of what they should be. Come on, somebody. Two people will look at you. You think they're opposing you personally. It's the spirit of God on the inside. See, they sense that spirit. They sense your love for God. They sense the holiness of the Holy Spirit in you. So when you step into the atmosphere, come on, somebody, things begin to shift around, and all the demons start getting stirred up. Come on, somebody. They don't want you there. Come on now. Because there's something about the light that you're bringing into their darkness, and they don't like it. Some people only hate you because of the way other people love you. Ooh. Come on, somebody. Haters will see you walk on water. Haters will see you walk on water and say, the only reason you're doing that is because you can't swim. <laughs> Listen, there'll be haters, there'll be doubters, and there'll be non-believers, and then there'll be you proving them all wrong. Come on, somebody. Making them eat their, I don't know about you, I find it so satisfying when somebody tells me I can't do something. And when I do it, come on, somebody, I ain't got to flaunt it, I just got to walk it. Because, you know, haters, people that don't like you, they're on your Facebook page all the time. Come on, somebody. Ah, oh, they don't hit a like button, but they're looking at what you're doing. See, what they are, they're confused admirers. See, they like what they see. Come on, somebody but they can't have you, and they, they can't be you. Come on, somebody. Oh, man. See, it's a time for haters. It's a time for us to turn haters and people that oppose us, turn haters into motivators. I don't know about you. I'm, listen, you need your enemies. You need your enemy because your enemy makes you better. Your enemy keeps you on your knees. Come on, somebody. Your enemy can can cre creates opposition. How many know? How many guys go to the gym? At the gym, if you're going to the gym and you're doing your reps, the reason your muscles and you're getting stronger is because of the resistance. Come on, somebody. People that resist you, God has placed there to make you stronger. See, God's not so concerned about your comfort as he is your character. And, and they will help you to build your character. Praise God. And the last thing is this. Her worship was generous. Her worship was generous. John 12, 3 says this, then Mary took, took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So Mary takes the very expensive perfume worth a year's pay and begins to, every say lavishly, begins to lavishly pour it on Jesus' feet. You see, grateful and genuine worship will cost you something. See, it's not cheap to worship God. See, but when, the, but when you love the Lord, giving is always a blessing, not a burden. See, when you love God and you understand what he's done in your life and he brings an opportunity for you to give, 
then you give with a cheerful heart. Amen. You give knowing that this is an opportunity to be a blessing, not a burden that we have to do because it's commanded for us to do. See, we don't do it out of rules and regulations. We do it from a place of relationship, a place of love that we have for God. See, the realization of all that God has given us makes it easy for us to give. See, I believe that people are not so generous at times because they need a, a fuller revelation of who Jesus is. See, it's hard to worship somebody with all your being, hallelujah, when you don't realize what they've done. See, we, a lot of us think, well, you know, pa pastor, I, I mean, my sin was not all that grave. I mean, I know a lot of people worse than I am. Uh, thank God, like that Pharisee said, thank God I'm not like this one over here. But how many, that, how many know that all sin? Come on, somebody. The Bible says that all have sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. It's not a comparison game. Listen, all sin will keep you from heaven. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about small sin as well as big sin. At the end of the day, if it wasn't for Jesus going to the cross, he became the answer to the sin issue in our lives and in this world. You see, when you, when you research other religions, I always ask the question, so what's your solution to sin? Guess what? Nobody has one except us. It's Jesus at the cross of Calvary shedding his blood that we could walk in freedom. The Bible says that because he shed his blood, it wipes away all of our unrighteousness, amen, and we can walk in freedom, hallelujah, and we can be generous. He was so generous, he gave all he had. He gave his life. You see, worship is giving God the best that he has given you. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says this, See what great love the Father has lavished, there it is again, on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Come on, somebody. You need to understand, when you look in the mirror, you're not just seeing yourself, you're seeing a child of God. See, when somebody opposes you and comes against you, they're not just coming against you, they're coming against a child of God. And the Bible says, I will bless those that bless you, and I'll curse those that curse you. So when they come against you, I, I look at them and go, that's okay. You have no idea who you're messing with. Come on, somebody. See, you're not messing with me. My father, come on. My father's a whole lot bigger than your father. Come on, somebody. And that's God's promise. And though he uses the word lavished, that means over the top, excessive. His love is so great. Listen, we don't even deserve it. And yet he loves us with such a generosity. See, it's easy to give him what he desires. It's easy to give God what he wants. Grateful, genuine, generous worship. It's easy to do that when you understand what he's done. And you see, worship is one last thing. Everybody say warfare. Oh, come on, somebody. It's not just an act that we perform that pleases God. It is that. But it's also an act that we perform that unleashes God. Yeah. Oh, y'all going to get that in a second. It unleashes the power of God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we see the Israelites. We see King Jehoshaphat and Israel and, and, and and Jerusalem and Judah surrounded by their enemies they were outnumbered there was no way in the human that they could ever win a battle against that big of an opposition but one thing King Jehoshaphat knew is he knew where to go do you know where you to go when the odds are against you do you know where to go when all of a sudden you look around you and there's no hope there's no answer to the issues. You're not sure what's going on around you. You think you're going to cave in under the pressure of life. He knew exactly what to do. The Bible says he called all of them together. He called all the, the, the nation of Israel together to meet at the temple of God. And they began to have church. Come on, somebody. 
they began to lift up their hands and began to worship God. And if you read it, uh, the Bible says that he called even the animals. And I mean, everybody fasted and everybody prayed in unison. And when they came to pray, you got to read the chapter. The Bible says that he begins to pray this powerful prayer. He said, God, are you not the God, hallelujah, of Isaac, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Are you not the God that delivered us from the hands of Pharaoh? Are you not the God that parted the Red Sea? Are you not the God that rained manna from heaven? Are you not the God that did all these things? He was reminding God, are you not the God what he was doing was reminding himself, wait a minute, this God, hallelujah, is the, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he did it back then, he can do it again. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together if you believe that. As he as began to pray and to worship God, all of a sudden, the prophet of God spoke. And he said, listen, don't worry about this. This battle is not yours. This battle belongs to the Lord. Oh, you see, it was in the midst of worship that God spoke and began and gave them that word. And the word of God says that God gave them uh, instructions for the next day. And they, and, they, and, they, and they set up themselves in battle array. And you see, most of the time, if it was us ground troops, we put all the tanks in the front. Come on, somebody. And all the, all the high firepower in the front. But they said, he said, no, no, you're not going to do all that. I want you to put the worshipers in front. Come on, somebody. I want you to put the singers in the front. I want you to put the musicians. See, they're going to lead into battle. And the word of God says that as soon as they get up the next morning on their way to the, to the place that they're supposed to uh, uh, see the salvation of the Lord, the word of God says they began to play music. They began to celebrate. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord... And they, they just started walking to the battle. Come on, somebody. And the Word of God says that when they got to the edge of the cliff and they looked down into the valley, the enemy destroyed themselves. The Bible says when they sang, the Bible says the spirit of ambush went out into the, into the camp and they began fighting with one another. They had a barroom brawl, come on somebody, and they never stopped. At the end, everybody was dead. And the word of God said they never had to lift up a sword. But let me tell you what they lifted up. They lifted up their hands to God. And they said, God, you are the God of victory. You are Jehovah Nisi, my victory. You are Jehovah Rapha, my healer. You are Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Hallelujah. And they began to worship the Lord. And then here's the blessing. The word of God says, the spoils. When God fights your battle, you don't walk out empty-handed. Come on, somebody. You walk out better than when you walked in. The Bible says that there were so many spoils. It took them three days to collect all the spoils and all the swords and the food and the money. And come on, they had, come on, they had one U-Haul truck after another U-Haul truck after another U-Haul truck. Three days worth loading up all the blessings. Come on, somebody. So when you allow God to step into your mess, you'll walk away blessed. Come on, if you believe that, put your hands together, give the Lord a praise. Ushers, will you come forward, please?